Documentaries are a unique form of visual media that can tell stories differently than any other medium. They offer the viewer the chance to be a part of an experience with the subjects of the film and to learn and grow along with the characters within it. Film, including documentaries, imitates the nature of its subject matter. Films about high society will present themselves as regal and polished, whereas films about average life take a very mundane appearance. Rock climbing, as a subject and a sport, has evolved rapidly over the past 20 years. What started as mountaineers tying a rope around their waist and scaling rock faces to reach a peak, turned into an Olympic sport that looks like this. That was incredible. Oh, that was incredible for Tomoe Narasaki. But how did it get there? And how did movies document that evolution? One of the oldest and most influential climbing documentaries ever made is a film called Rampage from 1999. It follows some of the biggest names in climbing at the time as they make their way up the west coast of the U.S. and into Canada, creating hundreds of new routes along the way, pioneering a style of climbing called bouldering. Primarily, Rampage focuses on a kid named Chris Sharma, an 18-year-old who would go on to become one of the best to ever do it. But at the time, he was just some dirty teenager, part of a fringe sport that no one really understood, and so were his friends. Rock climbing, particularly bouldering, was not even close to being a mainstream sport yet. It was a hobby for hippies and dirtbags who lived in their cars, smoked weed, and smelled bad. And the film reflects that. It's raw, grungy, it's unfiltered. It moves quickly, it doesn't explain much. In 1999, if you were watching Rampage, you already knew who these people were and what climbing was. The focus of the movie is the climbing itself, the raw progression of the physical limits of what people could climb with their hands and feet. It's effectively just a montage of climbs broken up by brief moments of friends hanging out at ratty Airbnbs or friends' couches. During the climbing, it isn't particularly artful, it's more so efficient. It shows all the moves and it does its best to exemplify their difficulty through a clear focus and minimalist approach. In the 2000s, climbing slowly grew into more mainstream lights. Competitions became more nationally televised, climbers began to integrate more with the communities they were from and the ones they were traveling to. And slowly, people outside the sport started to understand the idea that some people really want to get to the top of that weirdly shaped rock in the woods, and they want to do it in the hardest way possible. For some reason. The sport continued to change over the years, with one of the biggest factors being the explosion of indoor climbing facilities. Climbing gyms lowered the barrier of entry more than anything had prior. All the difficulty in finding crags outside, having the gear to safely climb, and having people to go with was gone. At a gym, you could just rent all of it. Well, I mean, except the friends. I still have to find those. Climbing gyms grew the sport to the point of nearly being a billion dollar industry today. In 2018, a record 50 new climbing gyms opened in the US alone. More and more people were finding the sport and, as a result, consuming its media. While this was happening, a little film festival called Real Rock was showcasing climbing related films from all around the world, as well as creating their own documentary content. The stuff they had created each year highlighted a prominent athlete in the sport and something they were working on at the time. Sometimes it was establishing the hardest route in the world. Sometimes it was following young, up-and-coming stars who climbed harder at age 13 than I do at age 21. Whatever it was about, it took the time to introduce you to the athlete behind the accomplishment. It wasn't just about Margot Hayes being the first woman to climb 515. It was about her personal battle of whether or not she was good enough to do that, and her life as a woman in the sport. It isn't just about Nina Williams being the first woman to send some of the hardest highballs in the world. It's about how she manages her fear, pushes her limits, and weighs risk with her passion. This new level of personality of the athletes behind the climbs marks the shift away from climbing media made just for climbers. Real Rock started to show non-climbers how average people fell in love with this weird, hard-to-explain hobby and went on to do some of the most difficult things in the sport. Then. 2018 happened. Easily the biggest year for climbing media. And that is thanks to a movie called The Dawn Wall, documenting Tommy Caldwell and Kevin Jorgensen's first ascent of the most difficult big wall on the planet is full of not only the most awe-inspiring shots of climbing ever, but also one of the most heart-wrenching stories of how perseverance, talent, and obsession shape your life for better and worse. I feel like there was something else that released in 2018, but I can't think of it for some reason. Oh, right. Free Solo came out that year. I forgot. Yeah, that one kind of skirted under the radar, though. I don't think a ton of people watched it. Okay, but seriously. 
even though I'm going to be asked if I have seen it for the next 30 years by everybody I introduce myself as a climber to, I can't deny the cultural impact it had on the mainstream appeal of climbing. Like the Donwall, it married the climbing-centric style of Rampage with the narrative, character-driven parts of Real Rock. Soloing El Cap is an incredibly large part of Free Solo. That can't be denied. But people would quickly forget about the crazy guy who did it if Alex Honnold hadn't been given the time to develop on screen into a character that people cared about and understood. And I mean, come on, just look at these shots. As climbing became more popular in culture, the media that covered it became more broadly appealing. The films weren't just for climbers anymore, they were for everyone. The personal stories of climbers were intertwined with the extreme athletic achievements to create media that stands out for its appearance and stays in people's minds for its narratives. 